today we're going to delve into the history of the Chateau. Now this is something that we've wanted to do for so long and this video has been six, seven months in the making really. Um, but it all started with us unsealing the door to the cellar and it got us thinking more about the history and just thinking more about that magnificent structure at the front of the Chateau and then thinking what it would have been like without it and who built it and this is what we're going to look at today. There is so many exciting and gruesome and crazy things. So we've had people sentenced to death that have lived at the Chateau. We've had people put in mental asylums that have lived at the Chateau. And it's all been thanks to the people that got in touch after we did the video in the woods last year, discovering some of the Chateau's history. Now it confused us and I'm sure it confused a lot of you as well. And it caused a lot of speculation as to what it was. We have all that now. So what we're gonna to do today is we're gonna do a video on two of the previous Chateau owners and they are René Charles Philippe de Saint Nicolas and Mr. Verdier David. So we're gonna look into what they did, what happened while they were here and just find out some of the amazing things that, that actually went on in the Chateau in, in, in the early days. So we're gonna start off with René Charles Philippe de Saint Nicolas. And just for simplicity, we're gonna call him René Charles for the rest of this video because I can't keep looking at this and trying to figure out his name every time. <laughs> it's so confusing. Um, but we're gonna look at him. The reason we're gonna look at him is we believe that the time and everything was, he was the guy that built the turret on the what is now the front of the chateau. So from getting this information, this all came from Lucy Bianfe and Thank you so much, Lucy, for putting all of this together. And like I say, it's proper documents that go on for pages and pages. And me and Terry were just talking about, we could do 20 videos on this, the amount of information she's provided with us. But he's a, such a, just a, a crazy character. So much happened in his life and at such a young age as well. So René Charles was born in 1789. And by nine years old, he inherited the lands of the Chateau the La of La La Salle itself. <clears throat> so from a very young age, he was the Chatelain. He owned this, this, this beautiful chateau, but he decided to do something different. Now, and again, it's thanks to Lucy, and I think it was thanks to Jean-Luc and Issa that provides us with the information. We've actually got the Chateau's birthday. So the square building that we're in, we always thought it was the 1750s. We've always said to you it was the 1750s because that's what we could see. But we've actually found out it was 1724 the chateau was completed. So this year celebrates its 300th birthday. And in what better way to, to bring her back to life after 300 years. So we'll go into René Charles a bit more now. So he actually was involved in the French army. His father was leader of the, I think it was the Orn Guards. So this whole, basically a state, if you like, his father was the general, he was in charge of the army of Orn. And René Charles ended up becoming um, leader of that guard as well. Not only that, he was part of the revolution that was going on at the time. So before, before René Charles was even 10 years old, he'd, he'd had, lived in a normal French life for him at the time and then it got changed um, to a different type of monarchy and then it became the Republic a couple of years later then Louis the 16th had his head chopped off this was all all before he's even 10 years old so he ends up in the guard in the guard of honor for Napoleon and this again we believe this the tower we believe to have been about 1806 so we've got that here that he was actually involved in the army at that time. And that leads into the what we read in Alanson as well, when we found out that he had a girlfriend. Obviously, I'm guessing she was in Paris. He was a general, and that's exactly what we read in Alanson. And she wanted, she didn't want to come to a, a little hovel in the countryside. She would only go to a palace or a chateau. Now, this isn't Versailles, but it played an important part into what was coming in, in the future as well. So, René Charles, I had actually with his build-up in the army, he'd actually invited Napoleon to Orne because of his position. And he brought Napoleon and his wife to Orne um, and, and showed them around. There's no indication that they came to the chateau or anywhere near here, but he definitely, there's definitely an indication that he brought them into the area. And, and that's why a lot of the buildings in the chateau, in the ground itself, so we've got the bread ovens, we know they were built in 1803 for the upcoming wars so that they could feed an army, so that they could look after their troops. And La La Salle was fully capable of doing that. It had over 100 hectares of land. We know it had farms everywhere. We know that it was completely self-sufficient. So we've got some, some, some of the crazy information with René Charles. 
um, he's actually in the site and we've actually got the what he looked like his description so this is the description in the army of Rene Charles one meter 67 tall oval face high forehead gray eyes well-shaped nose regular mouth round chin light brown hair and he has eyebrows so <laughs> it's nice to know that they were looking for somebody if they were looking for him that he had eyebrows I don't know how many people around at the time that didn't but that they, they they clearly made it um, a point and he was a bit naughty though Rennie Charles and this is where it gets interesting so as we were saying Rennie Charles he was a bit naughty and his life got really interesting but it was after he sold the chateau so some we're just reading here with it in 1830 uh, Rennie Charles and Rosalie sold the chateau they sold it for the 100,000 francs pretty much that they bought it for but what they'd done in the meantime is they'd sold all the bits of land off um, around the chateau and already recouped 185,000 francs so they were nearly what 80,000 francs up just from having the chateau for the, 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 the period of time that they did obviously they did a lot of work on it including now beautiful tower but this is where his life gets really interesting so obviously he was leader of the on guard he'd fought for Napoleon to defend on but he was also a royalist sympathizer as well and he, he had some very interesting ties with the Bourbon family and in the hundred day war that there was to try and replant Henry I think it was on the throne and get the monarchy back in charge of France he took part in the insurrection and, and was ready to, to obviously die and fight for his monarch and he was actually sentenced to death so we believe he would have been beheaded head chopped off guillotine gone um, but there was a, a procedural glitch in the courts so it never got carried through and in that time he escaped and ran off to Jersey also his wife divorced him at that time and we think that they, from what we can still see they were still living together um, and they were still a couple but she divorced him because she'd lost her assets because he was a treasonous traitor if you like um, to Napoleon so how strange and how interesting is that so Rennie Charles to give you an idea of time scales here we're, we're talking early 1800s to about 1820 and in 1816 um, Rennie had a child and his child, just for another tongue twister of a name, was Jules Charles Gabriel Leonce Philippe de Saint Nicolas. So <laughs> that's one, two, three, it's like seven, eight words just for a name. And he was the only child of Charles. And Charles um, had got married to, um, Rene Charles had got married to Rosalie. So that was their first child. And again, this is all in the time when we know that the turrets have gone on, our railings out the front. She's obviously had an influence on them. And it's just give, it makes us understand like why this was here and why it was changed. So it, we've got fast forward a few years and Charles and Rowley, Rosalie become the official owners of La La Salle. Now they've been the owners, but they become the official owners. And Charles was also the mayor of La La Salle as well. And for the chateau itself, he paid 102,400 francs. Um, and for that, he got the chateau, the farm, La Cour, which is the, the farm round here, um, the De La Chenerie, uh, De La Mitonnerie, and the coppice in the Heatherwoods, which goes as far back as you can see here. So we know from the documents that we've seen that in total, it was about 100 hectares. But while Charles was at the chateau, he was the one that was the inspiration for the tower and our secret door into the cellar. So let's go and take a look. So we know he's responsible for the amazing tower, but he's also responsible for these beautiful, beautiful tiles that we have here at La La Cell. Now, this again ties in with the time that he was here and it ties in with the time that they were registered in the archive in Paris. And it makes sense as to why they were registered in the archive in Paris, because we never quite got that before. But again, he was stationed in the army. He spent a lot of time in and around Paris and Versailles. And, and obviously I'm guessing that's the reason he's approved them there so that that's where it's been registered. And it gives meaning to, to the actual tiles being here. You can imagine him maybe being on active duty and walking in here for the first time and seeing these beautiful, beautiful tiles in situ. So it brings us on to our secret door. Now, again, this isn't a door that we've ever used or ever been able to use. And I'll show you why. So, we have our cellar down there, but the um, stairway's gone and it's about, what, 
10 15 foot drop down there so you'll do yourself a nice injury so this is our secret stairway our secret opening so from the um, outside you come in this is on your left hand side and it would have either taken you up into the shadow itself if you didn't go in the main gate but I get a feeling that this would have been more for the servants or pretty much solely for the servants because everything down here would have been in that sort of capacity you had the kitchen down here you had the storeroom down here which again was heavily guarded and, and locked the size of the lock on the door and how thick the door is they must have had some some amount of stocks in here and reserves to keep them going but when you've got somewhere like like Chateau de la La Salle back in the day when it was able to, to provide for, for a whole village, then they would have kept what they needed here as well. And they would have kept it under lock and key, which is, I suppose, why we had the revolutions and, and the things that happened at the time. So, yeah, it is romantic. It's nice to think about. So it, it's, it makes sense to us. But it does lead me on to the fact that this wouldn't have been the door that they would have brought all the food up. And I still think that that door in the corner of the dining room, I still think they would have been uh, straight up from the kitchen into the dining room because that just makes sense to me still. So we're still going to have to do some more digging on this one. I think we're going to have to dig that room out and maybe decipher what Rennie Charles did with that. Maybe he had some influence on what went on there. But we know when we open the door, it's got that beautiful um, paintwork panelling. Now, that's an expensive job, and it would have had to have been somebody like René Charles that had the money to be able to do something like that. So it, it is all start to, to make sense and feed into each other. But let's go and talk about Mr. Verdier David, who came up a few years after René Charles. We're talking 1890s, but he had such an interesting story, and he's so relevant to us as well, just in a name. Let's find out why. So now we're going to talk about Mr. Verdier David and that was a really interesting one for us because when we seen it, um, we bought the chateau from Mr. Verdier. So then to see information about Mr. Verdier David, a name that we'd never heard of before and see somebody that owned the chateau once with the same name, obviously you'd think that they'd be related or something but there's nothing to the, any of that. But there's some just weird coincidences and there's another one in this story as well which we found really, really strange. So, Mr. Vedia David owned the chateau in about 80, he bought the chateau in about 18, 1890, we believe, and he had a wife called Marie. Now, Marie died in, let's have a look, 1891, in Menton, in Alps Maritime. Then, 50, 60 years later, Paul Polino bought the chateau, and he died. But guess where he died? in Menton, in Alps Maritime. And it's just, it's a really strange thing for them to have lived at the Chateau, to have been here, then to have gone somewhere, hundreds and hundreds of miles away, a little town on the opposite side of the country, and they've both died there. It's just really strange to us. But the reason for this story, and the reason for we wanted to tell you about Mr. Verdier David, is the article that we were sent. And it made a lot of sense to us from... When we were in the woods last year, we got this not long after, and this was Lucy that sent us this. And again, it just made so many things make sense to us and it answered so many questions. So I'll read you the article and you'll start understanding why we were excited about that then. So, on Tuesday the 25th of May, 1880, a fire started around nine in the morning in the buildings of a farm located in La La Salle, operated by the Trehard family and belonging to Mr. Verdier David a yarn trader from Allenson. Considerable damage done, three buildings completely destroyed, as well as articultural, agricultural tools and fodder stacked in the attics. Fourth building, which was only newly built, where the fire has been set from three different places has been menaced, but the fire has been quickly controlled and this building didn't suffer much. The Trehard spouses lost their laundry and a major part of their furniture, cattle farm and equipment, cattle and farm equipment, they are all insured. There is no doubt that this disaster is a result of maliciousness. The prosecutor has been alerted by Mr. Verdier David. Mr. Desnos, who was the investigating judge, and Mr. Sudat, who was the deputy prosecutor, went immediately to the site, so came here straight away. The investigation they concluded led to the conclusion that the fire was set to the farm by a daughter of the Trehard spouses, aged 20, who does not seem to fully possess her mental abilities. 
She fully confessed. The young girl has been transferred by the administrative authority to the insane asylum, where her mental state will be examined. Now, this is again, this is a, a love story. It's somebody that's been, um, we, we think it's one of the sons of the Trehards. He's scorned his lady and she's come back and set fire. But to that point now, we can now make sense of what happened down there, what the stones were, what the rubble was, why it looked like it had been burnt. It was because it had just not in our lifetime or any time near any of our lifetimes here watching this. And we've had a look back on the cadastral now and it's, it's in the 1800s. There was a big building sat right at the top of that field on the same field where the, we found the, the ruins probably 200 metres, 300 metres away from the actual point of where we found the bricks and everything. But it just made for, it made everything make sense. We knew what had happened and, and finding things like this and having this ability to understand the land and, and what it was used for has just, it's been so good for us. So seeing that makes so much sense to us and it made so many things actually just fall into place. It's like, like I said, this jigsaw puzzle that we only have two three pieces together now we're starting to get a bigger picture of it and there's some other things that Mr Verdier David was actually famous for back in the day and is still famous for today so Mr Verdier David he was quite a he was he was, he was not a visionary in of his time but he, he did things differently and one of the things that he did, he changed the way that cider was made in France, not just here at the Chateau or anything else. He actually changed how it was done in this entire region because they weren't getting the maximum produce. And he came up with a way, and it's all documented in the newspapers, of actually being able to produce more cider. The way he changed cider making sounds so simple to me and you nowadays, but it's something that hadn't been done at the time. So he used to make the cider in the cellar below us here. Now we know we talk, he's talking about the cellar below us because he actually says um, his vaulted cellar wasn't warm enough to get the cider fermenting or it wasn't quick enough fermenting for him. So he decided what he was going to do, he was going to go to another part of the land, build a shed and he heated the shed. So he took these barrels up. Now these this is no mean feat. These are 1400 litre barrels. That's a massive amount of cider. Um, and he took them up to the shed and he heated the shed to 18 to 20 degrees. Again, not something that we would really think about, but he, these have had to really think about how they're going to do it. And what it meant was that his cider, he was able to get it brewed and fermented within 10 days by just by heating the cellar, by changing. We know that in summer down there, it's about eight degrees, nine degrees max. So 10 degrees difference has made a massive amount of difference to, to the fermentation process. And what that means is he's better taken advantage of apples. And he actually says this in the article, instead of having to sell them um, individually, he's able to sell it for bottles of cider, which sells for 10 times more. So he's changed the process and that change was adopted, we know, in our entire area. How cool is that? So that was just two of the incredible owners that we we know were here at La La Cell. And we've got information on so many more. Um, it The stories that they've got to tell and the, the things that we know about these owners and the, the things that have happened here. We've heard of the rich um, René Charles and, and his life here and what he did to change the chateau. But you've got the other end of the scale as well, where they've been in despair and they've lived in here with the chateau in disrepair and they've had to sell the lands off just to keep the chateau up and to keep it uh, to keep it stable. We've seen the steels upstairs. We know that they were put in in the 50s. And again, we know why and we know how it was done. We even pretty much know where the wood came from to put the actual um, joists in upstairs. Not only that, we we know that the chateau was stunning, and was surrounded by this blue, beautiful, beautiful panelling. But the panelling that was in the salon was apparently exquisite. And we came across a piece that was in the garage and it is so different to everything else in the chateau. And we've seen people that were actually in here when that panelling was on the wall still. And they've told us how amazing the, the, the room was itself. It's already amazing, but absolutely amazing. The top of the tower, lots of viewers have asked about the P. That comes down to one of the old owners, but it could be a number of different ones. We've got a Polino that lived here. We've got a Poisson that lived here. We've got Poissonniere that lived here. So we can link all that together and try and find out who the P came from. But it makes sense that there is a P up there because so many owners had P in the name as well. 
So let us know what you think because we've really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed doing this video. I love delving into the history. Let us know in the comments. Let us know if you like it, whether you want to see more and what you think of, of what we've uncovered today and what we spoke about today. If you have, please hit the like button, hit the subscribe button and make sure you've got the bell click for notifications and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. If you'd like to be part of our journey and help restore the chateau, then please join us on Patreon, where you'll be part of our journey, receive a piece of the history, and get exclusive videos.